also, uh, it is uh, 1230 or so um, on September 2nd. Welcome to the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee um, for, uh, for, for this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm Chip Troiano. I am vice chair and I am uh, 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 taking this uh, meeting today uh, in, in, uh, uh, in place of uh, our chair, um, uh, Stevens, who is on the road. And um, so uh, we have a schedule uh, that started with, um, with David Hall, who is not available right now. So uh, second on the agenda was Michael Desrochers. And Michael, if you would uh, introduce yourself. Uh, I don't have the ability to mute everyone. So if you could mute yourselves, that would help. I do have um, hands, hands raised and uh, I, can, I can monitor uh, questions, uh, requests for questions. So you can mute yourselves. That'd be great. Uh, Michael, introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. And uh, thank you uh, to the committee members for inviting me to testify today. For the record, I'm Mike DeRocher. I'm the executive director uh, for the Division of Fire Safety. Um, as you, uh, you may not know, but I've been working pretty closely uh, with the health department on this bill and with the uh, Rental Housing Advisory Board. Uh, I, I think what I'll do is, if you don't mind, I'll start by giving a high level overview of what this bill uh, looks like to us and what the landscape is, and uh, certainly take any questions uh, from that point. So in short, this bill uh, will turn over all rental housing, health and safety uh, over to the Division of Fire Safety. Currently, health officers and local municipalities conduct health inspections primarily in response to complaints. Uh, we have authority over these uh, rental properties uh, consistent with the health officers. So we have authority over these buildings. So there's actually two entities that actually get involved in or could be involved in a rental complaint local health officer or a fire marshal from the Division of Fire Safety. This bill professionalizes that process and gives the all the authority over to the Division of Fire Safety uh, to respond to these complaint inspections. Um, th that is the overarching part of this. And um, there's a lot of uh, collateral challenges with this bill, including um, the funding aspect of it and the um, and the registry, uh, the housing rental registry, that would be a major component of this bill that would actually provide an avenue for the funding. So that's that's the the GIF of the high level view of this would be that fire safety would take over rental housing safety. If a tenant complained, it would go to the division of fire safety rather than through a local health officer. Okay. Now, uh, Michael, tell us um, it, what um, is, is this complaint driven only or are there random inspections or uh, how, do, how do we perceive that working? The health department uh, did a comprehensive survey uh, that went out to all the local health officers and through some data uh, manipulation, uh, this would be complaint based driven only. We would, we would hire this bill proposes to allow uh, fire safety to hire five new fire marshal positions. In the very first year of startup, if we were to hire five positions, I think the, the total cost of that would be somewhere around 675,000. And then after we have our initial startup cost, the second year it goes down in, in price and the third year goes down a little bit further. Uh, the, where we sit right now is we have a hiring freeze. Um, we would be very hard pressed right now to onboard folks 
and get them the necessary training. Uh, we cannot send people out of state right now uh, to receive any, any kind of training. And uh, budget wise, uh, we're into collapsing some of our office space um, and collapsing that space down into state owned property. These are small offices that fire safety uh, currently pays uh, lease money for and we're trying to downsize in the space where fire safety would not be paying any fee for space. Okay, thank you. So I see two hands. Um, Representative Hango has her hand up for, with a question. Thank you. Um, Mr. DeRocher, could you please remind me of um, what the role of a local health officer would be? And I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. What would the role of a local health officer be if we went with the um, fire marshal model? Well, the, the local health officers right now um, as you can imagine, they, uh, under statute, they have rental housing safety codes that are part, part of their uh, responsibility. So that includes a number of health related uh, issues that right now, um, fire safety may not currently have the authority to enforce. Examples of that might be, uh, rat infestation, lead poisoning, asbestos, um, garbage removal. So they're, they, they, it's more of a sanitation type issue right now that fire safety does not have the authority to enforce. So this bill here would give us the authority to enforce um, those health and sanitation type issues. And there is some overlap. I don't have the specific details in front of me, but there is some overlap in the plumbing electrical already. So off the top of my head, probably 75 or 80% of those items that are on that checklist that the health officers use today are um, under the authority of fire safety. And I would also add that, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say here, but there, there, there's quite a bit of duplication of authority over these particular uh, rental housing units. Um, the intent of this bill is not to uh, diminish the health officer position. It is simply to have one agency in charge of the rental housing safety aspects. So I guess I'm, I'm, still confused as to if this bill were to pass, what the local health officers would be doing. Would they be simply fielding complaints from local landlords or tenants and um, funneling them to the Department of Fire Safety? Or would they actually be going out and doing inspections when there's a complaint? I'm, I'm just not sure what the local health officer would be doing if this were to be enacted? That's a good question. Um, so there, there's actually two parts to this. One being, uh, we certainly encourage working relationships with the local communities and the local health officers. Uh, the complaints would be funneled uh, through the local health officer and, and those complaints that they receive would go to us. And certainly we would, um, we would allow them to accompany us on the inspection, just like we do the local fire chiefs. Um, we've always supported a collaborative work and relationship with the local communities. Uh, that would be a pretty easy transition there. Um, a little bit of training uh, would have to take place with the local health officers uh, to iron those protocols out. but. Um, understanding that we do receive complaints now from uh, tenants and the uh, local health officer is not aware of them. So it's kind of a, uh, we pass each other uh, on these complaints. Thank you. So I see a, a, I'm sorry, who's on? 
I see a question from uh, Representative Kalaki. Representative. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike, I want to make sure I understood at, at the beginning of uh, what your, our conversation, you mentioned that this would professionalize. Um, what the, like what does that mean? And is it, is it an improvement on the current situation where you're crossing paths? I just want to make sure I understand your perspective. Yeah, uh, the word professionalize in, in, the, in our terminology would be uh, recognizing that the local health officer program right now, um, I think Sarah and maybe Wendy could articulate it better than I can, but th there's inherent issues uh, within that system. And uh, one part is uh, you're dealing with volunteers, you're dealing with a high turnover of health officers, you're dealing with uh, some health officers being very uh, complacent with uh, do they even write a report when they do a complaint inspection. Um, but Wendy and, and Sarah through the uh, Rental Housing Advisory Board can articulate this, but that's the gif of it is that uh, we have administrative penalties, we have an enforcement system, we have a tracking system in place on our database to track the inspections and uh, it's just a, a higher level of uh, of uh, control okay and but and that's positive yes okay but your, your other concerns are the cost of it and adding new staff and the training at this moment in time but the but the pro pro professionalization actually would be a good thing Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome, sir. So um, I just realized that um, I should have um, announced that uh, this testimony is pertaining to H 739, uh, an act relating to improving rental housing and health. So I just wanted to make that clarification. That's what uh, uh, Mr. DeRoche has been uh, speaking of um, for the last uh, few minutes. And we have another question, uh, Representative Sot. Yeah, I was just following up to clarify Representative Kalaki's uh, inquiry. You mentioned that the state's in a hiring freeze and as part of the memo that they issued for that hiring freeze, they said that uh, essentially people should only be filling positions that are truly critical in nature uh, now I'm curious, would you characterize this as truly critical in nature that it must be um, enacted today that there is such a crisis in the uh, health and safety of housing in Vermont that it is critical that we fill a position? Um, and even as you said, I'm just curious, we can't actually, you mentioned professionalization, but um, we couldn't actually have those professionals in place because we can't send them for the proper training to make them professional. Is that correct? So I guess That's let me correct. Just, right. Okay. In the midst stop. of this pandemic, that is correct. And um, I would, I, I personally wouldn't characterize this as a critical, um, essential hiring in the context of this, of this discussion. So just to clarify, then, if my understanding is that were we to pass this, we would be passing a, a bill for which we can't actually hire or train the people that the bill mandates. So we'd be passing a bill in a vacuum, essentially. That would be not not talking about the, the legal authority of the legislature and so forth. That's correct. I can't bring employees on uh, currently, and um, and I certainly can't train new employees in this particular environment as we speak right now. So that okay, and this is just my last comment for, uh, for now. Is this this just clearly sounds like this isn't the time to be passing this bill? Then I mean, we can't do. The, the agency can't do what we're asking it to do. So I don't understand why we would be passing the bill at this time. I can't speak, I can't speak to your decision that the committee makes. I can only say, you know, are there 
Are there aspects of it that can be beneficial? As the bill is written, not on testifying today, um, I can't bring positions on and I can't train the folks under these circumstances that we're, that we're experiencing today. Okay, um, so I see a question from Representative Waltz. Representative Waltz? Uh, it's not really a question. Uh, I testified before our Senate counterparts this morning on behalf of Chair Stevens, because I'm a co-sponsor of this bill. And I didn't know I was gonna be testifying until 7.30 this morning. So I had to do some real quick homework and I listened to David Hall's walk through to their committee, which was very helpful. And I think part of what the Senate touched on addresses the issues that representatives Clacky and uh, Zot have brought up. Uh, one is the funding, and that is a question the Senate is gonna look at. There is a request in there for 400,000 from the general fund, but this program is meant to be self-funded from the registry fee. And so, I think we want to keep that in mind. We're not necessarily going to be tapping a huge amount out of the general fund, especially in the future as we go along. And I think we can juggle the timing of the various pieces of this so that the funding can be in place before we actually hire people. So I wanted to make that comment. I think the funding is pretty easy to fix. We can, we can work on that. Another is even that if that were not the case, I don't see that as a reason for not forwarding this legislation. You know, if if implementation has to be delayed because of the of the pandemic, so be it. You know, if the state of emergency continues because of the pandemic, so be it. And when that situation ends, then we will have the legislation in place and be able to to actually implement much quicker. So I would urge people, if you uh, support this legislation to continue supporting it and don't worry about the effects of the pandemic at the moment. Thank you. So I would think that um, what you learned in the Senate today as far as um, the ability for a recommendation for uh, spending uh, some of this uh, 675000 um, for hiring um, may be possible, I guess. Is that accurate to say, to, uh, Representative Walt? You're muted, Tom. Tommy, you're muted. We can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. I'm sorry, I thought uh, I unmuted me and I muted uh, me, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, and the okay. Senate also ad addressed that too. They really think that uh, coronavirus funds can be tapped into okay. to help get this off the ground. And that's another piece they'll be looking at. So again, I think I don't think the funding is is something that should get in the way. Okay. Um, Representative Zott, did you not take your hand down? Is that why it's up after your last question? Okay, and I see Representative Hango, and I'd like to turn this over to uh, um, David Hall, who's here and could probably shed uh, some more light on what we're talking about here. We, uh, Representative Hango. Thank you. And thank you to uh, Representative Walls for letting us know what you learned in the Senate this morning. I'm finding it really difficult to grasp the concept of passing something that we don't have funding for. Um, affirmatively, I've been listening to the budget appropriations hearings and hearing all the various organizations who are pleading for more money. And I really do not see this as um, Mr. DeRocha said, uh, a critical need at this point in time when we're reeling from the effects of COVID-19. I'm very, very concerned about people even being able to, to get food 
to live their lives, to pay for transportation. Um, I know that there's, um, there's, there's a need for health and safety inspections, certainly. And I think there's a way to make this work at some point in the future. But my understanding of this special legislative session was that we were going to be discussing the items that are currently on the budget and um, that we need to deal with immediately in terms of using um, our funding and coronavirus funding. And to me, this just is not worthy enough at this point in time, um, especially in my district, um, even though we do have very old housing stock. So thank you for your time and consideration on this, but I don't think anything anyone is going to say is going to persuade me to support this at this time. Okay, thank you, Representative Hango. So what I would like to do is now direct this toward David Hall, who was apparently at the uh, Senate meeting this morning and uh, is with us presently. So um, David, if you can uh, give us uh, some more information or a uh, possible run through, whatever works best uh, as to maybe what happened in the Senate this morning and where we're, what we're looking at on this bill. Is that a big order? <laughs> Hey, good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. Uh, afternoon now, I guess. Yes. Um, uh, so the Senate just wanted to see what you've done on this bill. Um, this is 7, H 739. I walked them through the most current draft, the 17 page draft 3.1, um, which has, you know, multiple components in it. Uh, we've walked through it many times together. I'm happy to do that again now if you'd like, but uh, in a nutshell, section one, you know, uh, has the statutory language necessary to vest the authority uh, to inspect and enforce central housing health and safety regulations with the Department of Public Safety and the Division of Fire Safety. Um, <clears throat> the bill require, create, authorizes the creation of the rental housing registry for all housing in this rental housing in the state. Um, it imposes the requirement that owners of rental units actually register on the registry with the state. Um, it authorizes the creation of five positions within DPS for inspections and enforcement. It authorizes the creation within DHCD of one position uh, to manage the registry and another to enforce compliance with the registry. Um, the registration fee is $35. It's annually, it's per unit. That's the money that would be used to fund the positions and the operation of the program. Uh, the last parts of the bill are that there are you know, some housekeeping changes in the health title, Title 18, and then there's transition provisions, basically spelling out how uh, we will get to the point where DPS is the primary authority in state government for rental housing, health and safety. It will have concurrent, concurrent authority with local health boards and local health officials to administer the, you know, health and safety codes. Um, cities, municipalities that already have systems in place can continue to have their own systems. New municipalities could originate their own new systems if they wish to, but by and large, the problem this is trying to solve is the. Uh, lack of capacity in the rural towns and areas of the state to have consistent uh, personnel and enforcement capacity to ensure rental housing health and safety. Um, the implementation of this you might remember is staggered so that the authority and duty to create the registry to get it going comes first. That was going to happen on July 1 and then the requirement to register was going to come online January 1st. So fees would start being collected in January. And then the authority uh, to, to do the inspections and the hiring of the five positions was slated to come online in April. So all of that would necessarily be adjusted further down the line given that July 1st was two months ago. So 
you would have now, I mean, it'd be up to you, but let's say it's October. So every, all of those dates would be pushed back three months, for example. So start working on the registry, October 1st, start registrations in March, hire people at DPS and have the inspection authority in June or July of next year. That's just by way of example, relative to the way the bill is currently drafted, which was slated to take effect uh, this year in July, not anymore. So let me just, I wanna say a couple of things based on the conversation that you have, let me just settle the record for you as far as the state of the law is concerned, okay? So right now in statute, the State Board of Health, the uh, Commissioner of Health, uh, and local boards of health all have the same authority to enforce rental housing health and safety laws, and that's in large part at this point based on the Rental Housing Safety Code that was adopted by DOH. So right now there is concurrent authority the state entity with the primary responsibility and authority for rental housing health and safety is the Department of Health. It does not have the personnel, it does not have the capacity to, uh, to do what this bill calls on DPS to do, which is to have five dedicated people, professionals in the sense that that is their job, and they get paid for it on an annual basis to uh, inspect and enforce the safety code for rental housing. Um, there are large municipalities, a few across the state that have their own codes, have their own enforcement offices, uh, but that is the exception, not the rule. In large part, this duty falls to local health officers who are volunteers, part-time, um, and uh, not all towns have or can maintain officers. If this bill passes, that concurrent authority would continue. Uh, let, me, let me take one step back before I say about post passage. The other part of the current state of the law is this. The Department of Public Safety has authority for a lot, not all, but a lot of rental housing, uh, health and safety issues, building codes, energy standards, fire safety, you know, structural issues, there's a lot of overlap, but it's not complete with what the Department of Health can do. And the number I often hear is about 70, 75% overlap. So if this bill passes, it would just make clear that DPS has full authority for rental housing, health and safety, it would have the authority um, to adopt rules, either the code in the whole cloth or new rules governing health and safety. Um, the department already has the authority and uh, local officials and the state Board of Health already have the authority to conduct inspections and proceed with enforcement. It does not have to be complaint driven. You changed the statute recently to say that uh, if a local health official gets a report or is requested to conduct an investigation, then they shall do so. But as best I can tell from the language that I've read, and it's about 50 pages of statutes, there's nothing that precludes them from conducting inspections and enforcing the law. They're charged with enforcing Title 18. If this law passes, it may be implemented as a inspection driven, a complaint driven inspection program but right now, the statutory language does not say that. Um, right now, the Department of Public Safety has the duty and the authority to enforce you know, the laws and regulations that are under its authority. So whether that's building code, health and safety issues that are in its auspices, all of that, the, the statute is not, does not say you can only do this in the event of, an, of a complaint. They have the authority and the duty to enforce the law. If they determine that as a matter of resources, capacity, whatever, that 
the way they're going to set that system up is to be a complaint driven system. That's within their purview. That's within their statutory authority. But it is not mandated or precluded from it being in, uh, complaint only. I want that to be clear. So there's there's that uh, sort of universe of what they can do and then the universe of how they'll best decide to implement it. Um, I also want to say that and we walk through this language together it's been a while it was in March or maybe even February but right now at least under uh, 20 VSA chapter 173 sub 2 uh, fire safety has authority to investigate uh, you know, prosecute, enforce. They have the authority to require that a building be rehabilitated. They have the authority to require that a building be torn down, if that's what it comes down to. And uh, actually, the Department of Health has similar authority, that if there's a public hazard that creates such a level of threat, they could order a building and the issue of public health hazard either be remediated or even destroyed. So I, I don't want there to be any illusions about the scope of the authority. They have significant authority already, and this would bring into the fold this question of rental housing health and safety, um, and it's comprehensive. The registry itself would actually be housed in the Department of Housing and Community Development, and they would have to work in coordination with taxes, E911, fire safety, local boards, et cetera, to get all the information they need to have a registry of all the rental housing available in the state. The duty to register uh, extends to all property that is offered on a rental basis overnight. And that's the same with the inspection authority. So it's short-term rentals, long-term rentals, whatever. Uh, the only real exceptions are mobile home lots that are offered for rent and the owner of the lot doesn't have a home on that lot. Otherwise, if you're offering a mobile home for rent or a single family house or an apartment or whatever, if it's available for rent, it should be registered. And it's a $35 fee unless you're already paying a fee to some municipality for its inspection program. You still have to register with the state, but your fee payment would go to the municipality. So David, do you know if we have a fiscal note of what that uh, fee might generate over the course of a, of a year? Uh, I don't, but the number is what, 70 or 75,000 units times $35 less the amounts paid to cities. I do not know what that number is. Okay. Chip, Sarah Carpenter's raising her hand. She may yes. have that answer. I see that. So uh, do you have a figure on that, Sarah? I do, uh, and I, I can send it along right now to Ron. I actually given you a budget. It's not a it's not a true fiscal note, but you you can look at our um, projections. Where there's about fifty five thousand units not participating municipally. Um, we estimate in the first year of operation of the registry that we should have a minimum of forty percent participation. So we built our budget on on that, um, and uh, I think as um, David talked about the uh, the intent is other than the first startup year, there would be more than adequate um, income to support that. But I'll send that budget along to Rod okay. if he wants to post it. That would be great. And if you could identify yourself for the record. I'm sorry, Sarah Carpenter, chair of the Rental Housing Advisory Board. Great, thank you. So we do have a few questions. Um, Representative Hango. Thank you. I'm not sure who I should direct this question to, um, David or Mr. DeRocher, but um, originally we had talked about the need to upgrade a computer system, and this was way back in January that we spoke of this. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and we saw what happened with the antiquated unemployment insurance um, software. So where do we stand with that now? I seem to remember that there was a cost of around $500,000, but I could be wrong with that number of what we would need to stand up a computer system that could really um, work this effectively. So, uh, Michael, would you uh, care to comment on that? As uh, that would be your department. 
Well, I don't have any information on what it would cost to update this system. Uh, maybe Sarah can, or Wendy can chime in, but I think the uh, registry as it was going to be set up was going to be over to ACCD. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I have no firsthand knowledge of what this system would cost or what they have for an existing database now. I'm going to jump back in. It was the gentleman who came to testify from the department that deals with all of our information technology systems. And I can't remember the acronym. It wasn't ACCD. It was actually um, our state department of and ADS. I Thank you so much, <laughs> Agency of Digital Services. Thank you. And he did come and testify, and there was a dollar figure that was attached to this, but I'm not seeing that anywhere, nor hearing anybody speak of that. And that is another one of my concerns um, at this time in terms of if we're going to put money somewhere for a computer system, I would advocate it go to the unemployment system rather than this one. Thank you. And um, I see uh, Sarah Carpenter has her hand up. Is that something you'd like to comment on, Sarah? Yes, and I'll, I'll send along a budget. Again, um, the conversation has been the, um, we are well aware ADS has lots of um, things on their plate. This would take the existing databases that exist today within tax, uh, E911 and the Department of Health, combine them into a registry. The proposal is that this um, be done through some contractual basis. Um, already the Department of Community Affairs has a registry for mobile home lots. So we think this can be addressed fairly directly. Right now in the budget is about $100,000 to make that all happen. Um, I just wanna to be clear on that. The, I believe the conversation that ADS had was talking more globally and there is a, an additional provision within the Department of Taxes for the tax, the rental rebate form to renovate that. The proposal is to push that away for a year. That had a much higher number on it, but our proposal would not necessarily be affected by that. Thank you. I see a question from Representative Za. Yeah, I have a, a few questions or comments. I. I do seem to recall the same reticence from uh, the, actually two separate things. I, I, I remember hearing great reticence from the Department of Tax and wanting to share any of that information and they seem to have significant objections to providing that information beyond what's already publicly available. Um, and I do remember ADS saying they didn't have the uh, capacity, uh, I think it was ADS, they didn't have the capacity to implement this program. But again, this is part of the problem of coming back to this after so many months of having heard the testimony and trying to recall it. And in that spirit, I was gonna ask David a question. Uh, I, I think I've asked this question before. I just wanted a refresher. There's nothing in statute now that prevents any municipality from implementing an inspection program if they feel that they are under some crisis of uh, inadequate housing or unsafe housing, nothing stops them under current laws you just enumerated from in, in having an inspection program and and enforcing the law. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. There's statutory authority vested uh, r right now. Uh, and again, the commissioner of health at the state level and then also the towns uh, themselves to have inspection programs and I mean technically every town is supposed to have a, a local health officer. And so in that regard they already have the authority to do this if they the argument is being made to us absent of any evidence that I've seen uh, that they're they're lacking the capacity to do so but they could um, they could institute, say, a regional approach, like Barnard, uh, several neighboring towns tried to hire a regional energy coordinator so that each town didn't have to pay for a full-time person. They could have this professionalization, as we've heard uh, uh, the, uh, in testimony today. We could have these kind of professionalized inspectors, and sure, Barnard on its own couldn't, af couldn't afford it, but they could band together with its neighbors of Pomfret and Sharon, Thetford, Woodstock, et cetera, 
and they could all chip in to hire someone. That's what we proposed to do for an e a regional energy coordinator. Uh, Pomfret ended up going against it, so we were back to the drawing board on it. But any, any group of municipalities who lacked the resources on their own to do this could just band together with their neighbors and get it done. We don't necessarily, you know, we don't need the state to, to step in and do this. Anybody that has a concern could band together with their neighbors and get this done. I, I, and it's apparently completely statutorily authorized as well. So I, again, I feel like we have a solution in search of a problem that can be solved in other ways. I think I recall as part of that conversation that um, some towns that most all health officers are volunteers that some uh, towns do not even have health officers and that there is a reticence amongst neighbors to kind of rat out their neighbors uh, on uh, situations like this. So, you know, my, my recollection was that there were some, uh, there was uh, some discussion surrounding uh, health officers from uh, specific towns or, or certain towns uh, were not uh, capable of enforcing this type of, uh, um, of uh, 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 registry or uh, complaints. Maybe I wasn't clear in what I just said I, I wasn't suggesting that we rely these towns that have inadequate health inspectors that are operating on a voluntary basis. What I just said, what I just suggested was another path that could be pursued is that towns could altogether chip in to hire a professional who would not have those problems, who would then be adequately funded and resourced. If a particular town or a group of towns felt that they had this urgent need and problem, they could band together and do it outside of the state authority or, or outside of a state system. So that solves the problem that you're addressing, which is that we're relying on these volunteers and their friends, et cetera, et cetera. You know, your town, Chip Standard and Hardwick, all of those towns could band together and say, we're going to all raise taxes and we're going to chip in or we're going to institute a system similar to what's being proposed here, a, a registry, a fee-based system and we're gonna hire a professional to do this. If you felt like it was truly a crisis in Hardwick or Standard or your towns, you could do that. Instead of asking everybody all throughout the state to chip in when they're not having this problem. Okay, Sarah, you had a comment? Well, just, I wanna remind you all that we, last year we sent you a pretty comprehensive report. The rehab committee spent a lot of time looking at different options including implementation of a regional option. And what we opted for was the recommendation for the state option, because collectively, you're just not gonna get in a lot of regions enough units to hire somebody. If you look at the proposal, this is five FTEs for the entire state of Vermont. So you'd, if you divide the towns by five, you couldn't even do it in most places on a county-wide basis, because you wouldn't have an aggregation of enough um, activity to warrant it, you know, whether say a five or a 10 town thing. And having said that though, the, the one time you get a complaint in your town, the town is legally obligated to respond to it. And it's the liability of the select board if, if they don't. So we spent a lot of time on the regional aspect and really felt that it was just not gonna be workable. We talked to the regional planning commissions about it. Um, and this, at the end of the day, was the most efficient proposal that we thought was implementable. I see uh, Representative Hango, question. Thank you. Um, maybe more of a comment to Representative Zott's points. I went back through my notes and it was back around February 21st that we last heard about this and we heard from Sarah Carpenter as well as Craig Bolio from the Tax Commission and Doug Farnham. So um, at that time, uh, Sarah, I believe that you spoke about the need to upgrade the computer systems and um, I just wondered what exactly has changed in that um, time frame? And I do want to echo what Representative Zott said that the the problem with coming back to this after so many months is that we really don't remember all of the finer details of what we discussed at that time. Fortunately, I keep pretty good notes, and I do have um, documentation that Craig Bolio spoke with us and said that um, they they really were um, would need an upgrade and they were very reluctant to share any information um, 
regarding tax information addresses, whatever, with other agencies or departments. Um, so when Sarah spoke to us on that day, um, we talked about needing a computer upgrade and how the data would get to other state agencies if the Department of Taxes was not willing to do this. So I guess my, my question for Sarah then is what has changed between February and now? And um, also a comment for the chair that I would like to hear again from the Agency of Digital Services as to how this could be implemented and what it would cost. From, um, yeah, if you'd like to respond, sir. From my perspective, um, the conversation we had had earlier was in the context that the Department of Taxes is proposing to implement a much more robust landlord um, renter rebate certificate program. If they had done that and, and they're proposing wow. to delay it, um, it would be much easier to set up a system. However, they have one today that is publicly available. We Every October 1st, we get the number of units. We can find out the owners of those units. It's simply integrating that with the Department of Health um, current lead law um, database, which is terribly out of date, and then the enhanced 911. So it would be taking existing databases and essentially getting them to feed into each other. Um, I'm not a computer expert by any means, but the proposal and the amount of money that we've proposed um, would be more of a freestanding portal using the existing databases, not ideal, but eminently doable for the amount of information. We just need to know the location of the unit and the owner of the unit. And we believe that can be done now with existing databases and a program that would be wrapped around that. Um, I'm sorry, Representative Hank, we get a second question around. Um, um, no, I think my second question was a point that, or a request that we hear from the Agency of Digital Services and um, the Tax Department again. And I do want to remind my colleagues that the lead paint um, registry is very non-compliant. No, hardly anyone registers for that. So you're not going to be able to mine a whole lot of information off from that registry. Um, so I guess I just do not see how the pieces are going to fall together without a significant financial investment in this system. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um... Let's see now, <clears throat> David, do you have any comments uh, to wrap this section up uh, regarding the, <clears throat> oh, uh, excuse me, I, I'm seeing Representative Byron, did you have a question or <clears throat> a comment? Uh, uh, more of a commentary. Um, thank okay. you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, it, it, at the given moment, I'm just going to be very forthcoming with everybody. Um, I do not feel comfortable raising fees on anybody unless it's absolutely necessary. Given the current economic climate, this is a special session. I think we should be focused on budgets, things that are extremely teed up to move quick and do not cost money. Um, and that this is just an overarching belief that I personally have going into this multi-week special session that we have. Um, the cost of the unknowns on the IT, I, I've made it clear before with other conversations that IT infrastructure really, really gives me the heebie-jeebies when it comes to state government right now. Um, so I'm just going to leave it with that. I'm, I'm not comfortable moving forward with this during the special session. Okay, thank you. And <clears throat> back to you, David. <clears throat> I don't see any, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> any hands up. So I was just wondering if you had any uh, final comments. So, oh, I see. Actually, Chip Representative Clacky has his hand up. He does. Yes, he does. I'm sorry, Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I don't think we're at the point that we're moving towards uh, making a motion and voting on this bill, but uh, I would like to say that I'm actually in favor. And I think in hindsight, if uh, with COVID, we actually could have used this rental housing registry tremendously 
to really monitor and move people into safe spaces. And uh, so in hindsight, I think this would have been really, really beneficial for us and all the work we did with our $85 million of COVID funding to rehouse people and keep people safe. This could have been done more efficiently and effectively to serve all Vermonters. So that part of the bill, I really think is strong. And I, I, so I understand all the issues we're talking about in this truncated session, but I just want to put in my photo. Uh, let's look at the positive aspects of this bill as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Representative Waltz, was that a flash of your hand there? No, okay. So once again, uh, David, we'll try and get back to you <laughs> for a wrap up. Um, uh, any comments or um, advice as to what you've just been hearing? Nope. Nothing. Anybody has any uh, additional questions about the framework or the current law or the proposed law? I'm happy to answer them, but um, otherwise that's okay. all I have. All right. So seeing uh, no other hands, um, I think we can wrap up this section uh, uh, of our uh, committee meeting right now. Um, and the next on the agenda would be um, Wendy Morgan, uh, staff attorney from Legal Aid. And then we'll hear from uh, Ange Angela Zarkowski, uh, director of, uh, of um, uh, Tenant, uh, Landlords Association. So we're going to hear uh, from you folks uh, in relation to what's been happening as far as um, uh, um, uh, evictions and foreclosures, uh, some of the um, negotiations that may have been taking place that would be of interest, um, how people are being uh, made whole, um, how the hold on the courts may be working. Um, and uh, we just, uh, we've spoken, and I think Ron sent out uh, an email uh, that we, uh, a chain that um, uh, has, that we got this morning from uh, a new communication from the CDC, I believe, um, as to um, uh, 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 eviction uh, qualifications for uh, 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 protections on the, from the federal government uh, on evictions. So, um, Wendy, would you like to uh, start us off here? Thank you. I'm very happy to, but I wondered if Robert Spoon Sponable was going to testify um, on the previous section or not? Well, um, I just I, noticed that he's on and he's on yes, the agenda. Okay, well, I um, I don't know Robert, so I'm, I wasn't sure why he may be here. Uh, <laughs> Robert, um, is there something that you have to uh, add to uh, our discussion surrounding uh, 739? No, but thank you. Uh, I'm the deputy director for the Division of Fire Safety, so I'm here more as a as a learning experience as anything else. Okay. But thank you. Well, very good. Welcome, Robert. <laughs> so, uh, Wendy. Thank you. you. Yes. I'm Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid. I'm a staff attorney and uh, you've seen me around the legislature when you've been there and I've been there. Um, most recently, I've been appointed director of the uh, part of Vermont Legal Aid that is uh, putting into effect the money that you appropriated for us to help with the uh, rental housing stabilization program and also the um, mortgage assistance program. So. Um, I think you wanted me initially to talk a little bit about um, how that's been going, and then I'd like to circle back to um, 739 if, if that's permissible. Um, the first thing I want to say about the, um, the work that we've all been doing, um, particularly on rental housing, back rent, and uh, moving on money, money to move on, um, for people is that it's been incredibly uh, cooperative. And um, we've had a lot of work to do to try to set up the program that Richard Williams described to you maybe last week and that uh, Josh Hanford has talked to you about and Maura has talked to you about. In particular, um, a lot of what I've been working on has been the rental housing aspect of it as opposed to the um, uh, mortgage assistance part of it, but it's it's been a huge amount of work. Um, it's been uh, but incredibly cooperative, and we have weekly meetings, and we uh, 
identify problems that we've seen in our different programs. Angela Zakowski from the Landlords Association is also part of those meetings. I apologize for not mentioning her earlier. Um, so uh, you have a summary from me of uh, what the work that we've been doing since um, we first started having people and the programs were set up, which was um, July 13. Um, we've contacted over 450 people requesting help with rent or, or mortgages. And um, we've worked with 35 persons along with Rem Legal Services Vermont for people who are experiencing or threatened with homelessness. Um, and another 50 who've needed help retaining or obtaining habitable housing. And, um, and we've reached out to 250 to resolve existing eviction cases. So the staff that works under me is primarily doing callbacks to people who are calling people who, tenants who might need uh, assistance in paying rent um, and to help their landlords get rent, um, as well as the second part is to try to resolve all of the 600 or so court cases, eviction court cases, and there are also additional foreclosures. Um, that are in the courts. And so that's where most of our work has um, been. Um, are there any questions about that? Are those cases that you just referred to, Wendy, um, cases that were um, uh, in progress when the emergency order uh, um, was put in place? Um, many of them were, uh, but there have been some filings since the moratorium. So the moratorium went into place in May but it did not prohibit uh, landlords from filing evictions, right. but simply from serving them and, and proceeding with rent hearings, rent into court hearings and that kind of thing. So we, at the end of, at the beginning of August, we got a list from the courts um, of all of the cases that were pending as of July 31. Some had been, had disappeared, you know, since we got an earlier version of the list, but those were all the pending cases. And so we, our staff went through them, um, identified those where there were tenants who were not represented, asked the courts, <coughs> looked up the court um, documents that are online. And frankly, this is different in every county almost. I mean, there's several different systems working at the same time now. And in fact, four counties are gonna change their system actually this week. So it's, it's a sort of a, a difficult system to work with them because there's so many variations. Um, but we have searched the court records to try to find contact information for defendants um, because a court case normally doesn't have a defendant's phone number or email address. And that's obviously gonna be the most effective way to reach people. Um, we've reached out to the courts to get the defendants uh, contact information if we can. And if we can, we call them or email them or both. And if we can't get that information, then we send a letter to them to basically say, we're here to help you. You have a court action. Uh, if, if you and your landlord can work together to solve it, then we can help you dismiss the action. And that's really our goal is to dismiss as many of those cases as possible. So that illustrates one area where we have spent quite a bit of time uh, with um, VSHA, which is implementing the back rent program to sort of sort out how do we handle the court cases differently from just any old uh, landlord or tenant who wants to apply for money to help pay for the back rent. So um, we are working on those. We hope to have many greater numbers to you by October when you, your next report is due um, of those actually being dismissed. Um, so uh, Wendy, when you, when you say dismissed, the, uh, explain that a little bit uh, more for us. These are cases that were resolved as a result of negotiations between um, legal aid and the landlords uh, association um, and were um, satisfied um, prior to the dismissal? Is that what you're uh, suggesting? Yes, yeah, so in the normal course, in the non-court cases, both the landlord and the tenant apply for back rent. Right. I'm not talking about the moving money, but the back rent money, both of them apply. If there is agreement, um, then the, the money gets deposited directly into a landlord's account 
and the landlord agrees not to evict for the number of months that have just been paid um, up to six months. Um, in the court case situation, uh, obviously the landlord has incurred additional costs um, in filing and service and that kind of thing and may have a, incurred attorney's fees. And what VSHA has agreed to do now is rather than have the normal process of two applications, they will take a stipulation of dismissal that's signed by both the landlord and the tenant, and usually by the attorney for both the landlord and the tenant, which in many cases I think will be the Landlords Association and Vermont Legal Aid or Legal Services Vermont and submit that to the housing authority and they will pay those expenses so that the case is actually dismissed. And then we file it with court and then it's dismissed, um, which will help alleviate the pressure that's going to be on the courts whenever the moratorium uh, is over because there will be many more filings at that point in time. Frankly, you know, I wish everybody would contact us in advance if they're thinking about filing and we could try to resolve it, but that's sort of where we are there. And I think you already heard mention maybe from David or others today that the uh, feds, the CDC has just issued a moratorium until the end of December as well. So even though the Vermont moratorium goes until the governor declares the end of the state of emergency, plus in most instances, 30 days, um, that's now going to be December for evictions, not for, for closures. So is that federal protection uh, granted only to um, federal uh, uh, guaranteed mortgages uh, or such? No, it is okay. not. So it's broader okay. than what was in place prior to okay. and that expired on July 24, as I recall. Okay. So it's yep. broader than that. And it's really a reflection, I think, of, I mean, I frankly was shocked to see that come from the feds right now, but yeah, yeah. it's really a reflection of their concern about the pandemic, mm -hmm. I think, and, and the, um, you know, the growth of cases and deaths. How about um, use of uh, um, first, last, and security uh, fund monies for people who are, who were, uh, had to move during this pandemic? Has that been um, utilized to any extent, Wendy? So that is um, that part of the program has just recently been sort of um, um, developed and solidified really okay. at a meeting yesterday um, that we had, as I mentioned, we have weekly meetings with VSHA and AC, um, DHCD and the Landlords Association and Legal Aid. And so that was all put, um, you know, sort of concretized at that point in time. And it's not posted yet, I don't believe. If you look at the rental housing, if you look at VSHA's website, it's not posted yet, but it will be soon. But in the meantime, we have been um, encouraging people to let us know uh, so that we can work directly with um, the, the um, sorry, VSHA to get those monies out the door because one of the big problems is, and frankly, the biggest problem I would say is the lack of units, the lack of affordable units. So whenever anybody has a place to move, they need to move really quickly because otherwise somebody else is gonna take it. And when I asked uh, my colleagues for stories of problems people were having during this time period, um, the the lack of places to go and being shut out because you couldn't move fast enough was really um, a significant factor for people. And so we will have with the VSHA, a, the people won't go through the regular takes up to 10 days program to get the money. We're gonna have a fast track way to do it so that people who can move and have a place can do so very quickly. So the other th uh, question I had was um, it, the uh, idea or the requirement that both tenant and landlord apply uh, for this. Um, has that been, uh, and, and, and you, your comment that um, uh, email addresses and, uh, and, and phone numbers are not readily available for tenants often, has that been uh, a, a barrier to uh, widening this program, Wendy? Um, yes, and let me just pick up the last point you mentioned about email and phone numbers. Um, the 
the application now online for landlords does require that information, but that wasn't true originally. So we have a lot of backlog of those. But, but in answer to your question of whether or not there are landlords who won't agree to group one, uh, which group one is, um, they both agree the money is going to go for whatever back rent there is. And that can, by the way, go prior to March 1st. So it can be su significant amounts of money that a landlord can get. And to get that, the landlord has to agree not to evict uh, for the same number of months going forward right. up to a maximum of six. Okay. And there are definitely landlords who do not want to do that. My guess is, and Angela can, can uh, talk further about this, but my guess is that some landlords are gonna shift on that now because they're, they're gonna be in a four month moratorium anyway with the feds. So why not take the money? It's a maximum of six. It's gonna take you a couple of months to get into court anyway. So you're better off getting all of your past due and being able to move forward. So I, and I certainly hope that that happens because we do want to get as much of this money out the door as possible or have BSHA get it out the door as possible. So. Okay. So um, I see we have about 20 minutes. Um, and I also see that uh, from moving into our day's uh, uh, schedule that uh, we kind of, although you had an, some opportunity, Sarah, to, to speak that um, you were here to uh, present. So um, uh Representative Kalaki has a question, then I would like to move on to uh, Angela to, uh, um, to have um, her uh, um, input from this and then save a little time for you, Sarah, to wrap things up today, okay? So, uh, Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I'm re Wendy, I'm reading the, uh, your memo that you sent us, which is posted on our committee website, and thank you. I'm, the, the timing of this is interesting because if, um, the CDD, CD has now extended the moratorium till December 31st, and the CRF funds have to be expended by December 31st. How is this all going to work? And will we, will we be able to then extend um, these programs for both rental arrearages and mortgages beyond December 31st? Well, there is certainly huge desire for that to be, happen, particularly because at this point in time, I think um, Richard Williams would tell you that he does not anticipate all the money going out the door if it has to be out the door by December 30th, which is the date that they have for some obscure reason. Um, but uh, so everybody would like it to, but we're not assuming that it will be extended. And so you're absolutely right. There is going to be a need for money beyond December 30th or 31st, but it's not available at this point in time. And I appreciate you um, raising the memo that I sent to you all, just because I'd like to touch on it. And, and if you would uh, permit me, Representative Traiano, uh, just very, very quickly to say, okay. um, the first part of it is giving, uh, I, we would recommend, um, that DHCD be given more flexibility if they are going to be adjusting any of the monies that have, you have awarded in um, H966, which are basically in a, in a couple of different big pots, but there may be some other things that they think are useful. And so we would recommend that kind of flexibility. I also talk about um, creating the rental housing registry. I really think that it is such a simple thing to do the basic registry that we just should do it and uh, use it for the remainder of the, the time that we have, the four months that we have. Um, the third item is transferring habitability to fire safety. And I would echo what Representative Kalaki said earlier that I think, or maybe it was Representative Walsh, that really this transfer should happen because we don't have a good system in place now. We have volunteer health officers that are not going into homes or if they are, they're not doing it in a professional way. They're not necessarily masked. We've got that kind of complaint from um, tenants. And um, the fourth item there is uh, picking up on a notion that Senator Sirac can put forth on how to improve the, the situation going forward. What have we learned and what can we take from it? And I would suggest that you uh, charge the Rental Housing Advisory Board to, to take a look at that. Okay, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, 
So um, I would like to move right on to uh, Angela. Are you uh, on the beach today? Is that what you say? I, I'm not on the beach, okay. um, <laughs> but so I, am, would, I uh, am away. Okay. <laughs> so if you would give us um, some input and save a little bit of time for Sarah, um, who uh, was on the agenda and I passed her over. So um, uh, take it away, please. Abs absolutely, I will be brief. Um, for the record, my name is Angela Zaykowski. I'm the director of the Vermont Landlords Association. Um, and since the committee has uh, recessed in June, uh, the primary focus of my organization has been working on this rental housing stabilization program, um, helping design it, get it up off the ground, and now is in sort of the outreach and information phase from the landlord's perspective. Um, so when the program first launched in the middle of July, uh, my organization was primarily uh, just answering questions, providing information to landlords about the program, helping people with forms, providing them with forms. Um, and since that time, those calls have tended to drop off a little bit, but we've moved on into directly reaching out to landlords. Um, we have approximately 450 to 500 landlord applications that do not have a corresponding tenant application. So these are landlords who have applied into the program for what we're referring to as group one funds. So these are landlords who have said, we want to fully participate in this program, um, but did not have a tenant application that came in uh, for that. So my organization has been direct to reaching out to those landlords um, to let them know to try to get contact information for the tenants um, so legal aid can reach out to them. Um, what we have been finding is that a substantial majority of those landlords have just taken it upon themselves to go collect those applications from the tenant. Um, so the complete package of forms can be submitted to the program um, for payment of full rent in full for tenants. Um, so we've had or made about 438 direct calls to landlords um, for that portion of the program. Um, I know there had been some concern at one point about members versus non-members uh, participating in outreach to my organization. And I'm sort of happy to report that only about 15% of the calls I've been getting are from my own members of the association. So substantial majority of uh, the folks that we're contacting and having communications with are not members of the association. Um, so that has not been an impediment at all for landlords to reach out or feel comfortable reaching out to the organization. Um, one, as Wendy mentioned, uh, we have been holding weekly meetings uh, to sort of deal with issues or uh, confer passing information amongst all of the folks that are involved in this program. Um, that has been incredibly helpful, I think, to everyone. Um, my organization did uh, create a informational video. Um, it was an animated video. I provided a link to it to Representative Stevens. I don't know if he circulated it to the rest of the committee. If not, I can make sure um, that you all have it. Uh, we are also currently having that video translated into seven different languages. Um, so it's a uh, video that just provides basic details. Um, it's appropriate for both landlords and tenants um, about this back rent program. So have you, started to, have you started to see some results from the landlords that you have reached out to in order to get information from their tenants in order to complete these applications, uh, Angela? Yes, we have been seeing a um, very high level of resubmissions um, by landlords uh, with the complete um, package, complete information. Um, the other thing that we have seen uh, that I think none of us uh, particularly anticipated was the landlords have the ability to apply in to the program for what we call group two. Um, and group two is the landlord will take half of the back rent that's owed, but still retains their eviction rights. Um, 
under the program. And one of the things that we've seen is that when landlords have received that group two payment, um, almost immediately they've become more interested and more willing to discuss applying in for group one. Um, so with that payment of half rent, uh, I think some of the angst or aggravation of not having received rent uh, gets alleviated and they're much more willing to consider uh, applying in to stop an eviction or to receive full payment. That's great. That's that's good to hear. So um, are, are you, is, is it your opinion at this point that um, we are making good progress uh, on this uh, on these uh, negotiations and uh, protecting both landlords and tenants. Um, yes, from a from a monetary standpoint, um, I think we are making very good progress. Um, I, a few you know press releases might be helpful uh, to share some of the successes of the program. Um, if we can find uh, match some landlords and tenants who are willing to talk to the press about the benefits of the program. Um, I think that would also go a long way for outreach uh, to some some landlords who maybe are on the fence about participating in the program. Um, I would also echo what Wendy says, said with the new CDC um, restrictions, we may see some more landlords come to the table um, since no matter what happens in Vermont, they are not going to be able to evict for non-payment or rent through the end of the year uh, under the federal, the federal moratorium that was just issued. I would like to hear um, about the progress as it goes on, if it's possible, Angela, you know, um, especially um, getting uh, landlords and tenants to uh, uh, advertise um, the benefits of this uh, program. Yes, and I think that's um, now that we've maybe come out from under the sort of the big push of launching the program and the first sort of flurry of applications and activities, um, we can focus a little bit more on looking at who's been participating and direct reach out to some of those folks to for press releases or other um, promotion of the program. Great, great. I appreciate it. And it's really good to hear that uh, things are working in this uh, in this order. So uh, um, thanks both to you and Wendy for your hard work and uh, for um, encouraging reports. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So um, I guess we could wrap it up. Um, you've got well, we're on the floor at two o'clock, so um, it's uh, 10 of right now. Uh, Sarah, if you'd like to take a few minutes, we're, we're swinging back to uh, uh, 7 a, uh, 7.59 and um, the registry. And uh, if you have some more comments to make, uh, Sarah, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, a lot of the questions I think have been answered, but um, I just want to reiterate um, how important I think this is now more than ever. This is about health and safety inspections. If you are sick, you're running a fever, you're at risk, and you have no running water, you have no working toilet, you have trash in your yard, all of those things, who's going to make that inspection? Right now, it's the town volunteer, and if the town volunteer is not around, it's actually legally the select board chair. The system is not working. Many towns just cannot recruit health officers. Um, and so I, I think now more than ever, we need this. The bill is proposed, the fire safety transition would not start till April 1. That could be moved a couple of months, but it's not gonna start this minute. Um, I think the training aspects could be, um, you know, addressed by online training. That's how everyone else is doing training. And we need to get this up and running. Residential rental housing is a $900 million business in the state of Vermont. There are 76,000 units that people earn business revenue from. You know, we inspect inns, we inspect childcare centers, we inspect tattoo parlors, beauty shops. What other business aspect are we using volunteers to inspect? You know, these are places people live, you know, 15, 18 hours a day. And I just think it's, it's we've got to make the move to transition the system to protect people. And now again, with the virus now more than ever. So I just encourage you, the timeline can be a little bit adjusted, 
the ask on the money side is not big. It's very rare you get a program that can support itself after the first year. Um, in fact, we've done very conservative projections. I think it'll, it, it could do better than what we're projecting. Um, right now, 21,000 landlords in the state already pay a fee, some as high as over $100 a month. So the $35 we're asking, I don't think will break anybody's business model. Um, and I think the, um, what we will receive in return uh, will way, way up that. Great, thank you. So I, I think that's a wrap for today. Um, we're on the floor at two o'clock. And uh, Ron, is there anything that? Uh, same time, same place, different link tomorrow. Okay, fair enough. We'll try and get the right link. <laughs> the right day, I should say. Okay, so uh, everyone, thanks very much. Thanks for everyone who came to testify and Robert who came to listen. Um, and we'll see you at the floor at two o'clock. Thank you.